few months before the suppression of the rebellion started by the traitor Ahmed Pasha in Egypt, the Safavid Shah Shah Ismail had died and his son Tahmasweit succeeded him. However, his accession had not been notified to Istanbul via embassy. This behavior indicated that he was going to take a hostile attitude towards the Ottomans. For this reason, Suleiman the Magnificent did not deem it necessary to congratulate him on the succession. He was even angry about it. Since he was informed that the new Shah was engaged in hostile activities against the Ottomans, he dictated a heavy letter to Nishanji Jalalzadeh. In this letter, he expressed that his behavior was not correct and hinted that he would soon embark on an eastern expedition and capture Tabriz, Azerbaijan and perhaps Iran and Turan. This insinuation of Suleiman showed that he was planning a Turanian expedition like his father. His aim was to ensure unity by dominating the Turkic countries, to completely dominate the West with the mighty force that would emerge, and to fulfill the ideal of the longed for state of the world, and to realize the goal of the Prophet. For Iran, the Uzbeks were ready to help, and the Ottomans were already friends with the Uzbeks. However, the danger of the European Union, which was organized around Charles in the West, prevented the realization of this great ideal. The Safavids were sending envoys to Charles and the Hungarian king and were trying to organize joint action against the Ottomans. In the years coinciding with the beginning of the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent, Germany and France, two of the largest European states, had become enemies and started to struggle against each other. While the political struggle between these two great states was going on, Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant sect, emerged and Western Christianity began to suffer from a religious crisis as well as a political crisis. In 1516, Charles became king of Spain and in 1519, he was elected German emperor. Thus, when Charles became a ruler with very large territories, France was surrounded by Charles' lands. The French had suffered many hardships in the years of warfare with the Germans on the frontiers of Germany, Italy and Spain. The French, who were very worn out in all these battles, suffered the biggest defeat against the Germans at the Battle of Pavia in 1525. In this great battle, King Francis of France was captured by the Germans. Charles sent the captured French King Francis to Madrid and imprisoned him. The French, whose ruler was captured, were in a difficult situation. Meanwhile, an activity against Charles also emerged in England. King Henry VIII of England, calculating that the whole of Europe would fall into the hands of the Germans after the defeat of France, signed a neutrality agreement with France by leaving the German alliance. Thereupon, the papal, Venetian and Florentine governments politically sided with the British. The only state that could break this gigantic German power in Europe and deal with the Germans was the Ottoman Empire. Since the Ottoman Empire was an Islamic state, it was considered blasphemous by Christians at that time for a Christian state to seek help from an Islamic state. However, despite this, it was the Muslim Turks to whom the French opened their hands. King Francis of France and his mother Louise de Savoie found salvation in appealing to the great Turkish Sultan. For this purpose, they wrote a letter and sent it to Suleiman the Magnificent. In 1517, Francis, who had brought an offer to Charles to divide the Ottoman Empire, was now hoping for help from the Ottomans.
then Mercedes Jean de Frangipan, who brought the letters of Francis and his mother, was asking for help against the Germans from Sleiman the Magnificent on behalf of his sovereign. The help requested from Suleiman the Magnificent was to attack Charles' brother Ferdinand. If Suleiman the Magnificent was to launch an expedition against Ferdinand and his protégé Hungary, Charles, who would be in a difficult position in the east against the Turkish power, would reduce his pressure on France in the west and France would be freed from captivity. The Ottoman Sultan's help to the French would have been possible by marching on the Germans at the head of his armies. Since the Hungarians were in front of the Germans, the Turkish blow would undoubtedly land on the Hungarians. Francis' letter was briefly as follows. This is my request to His Excellency, the Sultan, the ruler of many countries and cities of the world, and the master of all oppressed people. When you attack the King of Hungary, even we, with your help and favor, will take our revenge by escaping from prison and attacking King Charles V of Spain. You are the king of kings. You are the one who has great honor and glory. If you have the grace to defeat him, you can be sure that I will be a good servant from now on. Suleiman the Magnificent did not remain inactive in the face of this request of the French. Because Sultan Suleiman considered the great European empire that Charles wanted to establish as dangerous for the Ottomans. He wanted to see not a united Europe, but a divided Europe. While Europe was shaken by Catholic and Protestant sectarian strife, the Ottoman Sultan's protection of the French would divide Western Christianity into two. The shaking of Christian unity would facilitate the advance of Islamic conquests towards the interior of Europe. Sultan Suleiman not only wanted to take France under his protection, but also to support the Protestantism sect founded by Martin Luther. Protestantism, which was born in Europe as a reaction against the Catholic Church and the papacy, was supported by some German princes and peasants. This emerging sect also attracted the attention of the Ottoman state and ways to take advantage of it was sought. Suleiman the Magnificent contacted them through his intelligence organization and decided to help them both financially and morally in order to ensure the success of their movement. He even considered Protestantism closer to Islam than Catholicism and considered them as people who had become capable of accepting the Islamic religion. Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, said that the Turks were a divine force sent by God and even claimed that resisting the Turks would lead one to apostatize. Replying to the letter of the King of France, Suleiman the Magnificent addressed him as follows. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. With the help of Allah Almighty, and with the blessings of the miracles of the last and greatest of the prophets, Prophet Muhammad Mustafa. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And with the support of the holy souls of the four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali. May the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala be upon them. I, Sultan of Sultans. King of Kings, the shadow of Allah on earth, who bestows the crown to the monarchs, the supreme ruler of the Mediterranean, and Black Sea, the Balkans, and Anatolia, and Azerbaijan, and Damascus, and Aleppo, and Egypt, and Mecca, and Medina, and Jerusalem, and all of the Arab dominions, and Yemen and the Sultan and the Supreme King of many nations, which my ancestors conquered, and which I possess with the power of my fiery spear and my victorious sword, Sultan Suleiman Khan, the son of Sultan Selim Khan, the son of Sultan Bayezid Khan. You are Francis, King of the French province. You have sent a letter to my door, the refuge of kings, informing me that your country has been invaded and that you have been captured and imprisoned. 
you ask for my help to get out of this situation. Keep your heart content and do not be sad. Remember that captivity isn't a strange thing for the rulers. You should know that I, always walking with my sword as my ancestors did, do not hesitate to go on expeditions and make conquests. I am ready to fight at any time. Only Allah will do what he wills. You will learn from your messenger what I will do. Written in the beginning of Rabiul Akhir in the year 1932 in the city of Constantinia, the gate of the Supreme Sultanate. Thus, while the Ottoman Empire was preparing for action against the Germans, a political grouping against the Germans was also visible in Europe. If Suleiman the Magnificent struck a blow against the Hungarians, it would be at the expense of the Germans. Because when Hungary was invaded, the Turkish armies themselves would come to the German border. In addition, since the Hungarian King Louis II and Charles V were related, Charles was closely interested in the future of Hungarian lands. Hungarian King Louis II had married Mary, the sister of Charles and Archduke Ferdinand, and Charles' brother Ferdinand had married Louis' sister Anna. Since Louis had no sons, Archduke Ferdinand considered himself the heir to the Hungarian throne. Charles, who was following the Ottoman activities against Germany, contacted the Sefavid Shah Tahmasp and agreed to take joint action against the Ottomans. When the Ottomans advanced against the Germans, the Sefavid would also take action against the Ottomans from the east. Being aware of this situation, Suleiman the Magnificent established a close friendship with the Uzbeks, and the Uzbeks were ready to attack the Sefavids in such a situation. All winter, preparations were made for the conquest of Hungary. Ships were built. New cannons were made. The Turkish artillery in this period had reached the most advanced power in the world and had reached a level not found in any other state. Due to events such as the Hungarians meddling in Wallachia's affairs, their alliance with Moldavia against the Ottomans, the danger of Charles establishing a European Empire, and on the other hand making an agreement with the Sefavids, it became essential to make a campaign against Hungary. After Suleiman the Magnificent had assured the French ambassadors that he had taken France under his protection and that France would be liberated, the tomb of Abba Ayyub al Ansari, the tomb of Abul Wafa, the tombs of his father Sultan Selim, his grandfather Bayezid, and his ancestor Sultan Muhammad were visited. After these visits, on April the 23rd, 1526, with an army of 80,000 people and 300 cannons, he set out from Istanbul to Hungary. From the moment of departure from Istanbul, the march of the army took place in great order. Entering cultivated fields or causing any harm to the people was strictly forbidden. Those who attempted such acts were severely punished. The Ottoman army marched to Belgrade via Edirne, Plovdiv, Sofia and Nish. Pargal Ibrahim Pasha, the Grand Vizier and at the same time the Baylor Bay of Rumelia, left the Sultan to go ahead as vanguard. The vanguard forces of the Grand Vizier consisted of the Rumelian military, 2,000 Janissary armed guards and some artillery. These forces marched to conquer the city of Pedro Varadin, an important position on the Danube. The city withstood the Turkish siege for only 12 days. The Turks easily captured the city by entering through two breaches opened by the explosion of two sewers dug under the walls. In the meantime, the Bailerby of Bosnia had entered the territory of Sirmi and conquered all the fortresses there. After celebrating Eid al Fitr in Belgrade, the Great Army under the Sultan's command marched along the Danube. When they arrived in front of the castle of Uylak, it was also subjected to a tremendous siege. 
At the end of the seven day siege, Oilak surrendered, and this place was conquered. Suleiman the Magnificent informed the soldiers here that the direction of the army's conquest was Buda, the Hungarian capital. Meanwhile, Hungarians were gathering troops from all over the country for the total defense of their country. The Turks started to capture the castles along the borders one by one, which caused a wave of fear to spread among the Hungarian people. King Louis II asked for support from the German Emperor Charles. However, an alliance was formed between England, France, the Pope, Venice and Milan against the German Emperor Charles. When the Turkish ruler Suleiman the Magnificent attacked the Hungarians, if Charles led his armies into Hungarian territory against the Turks, this alliance would attack the German Emperor behind him. Seeing this situation, Charles was therefore doomed to remain inactive in the face of the Turks' attack on Hungarian territory. He only sent a few thousand German forces to the Hungarians. Although the papacy sided against the Germans, it did not want to let Catholic Hungary fall into the hands of the Muslim Turks. Therefore, it sent an army to support the Hungarians. Croatia, Poland, Bohemia and Bavaria also sent troops to support the Hungarians. At that time, the Hungarian armored cavalry was the strongest force in Europe. The number of the Allied army gathered under the command of Louis II exceeded 50,000. While King Louis moved towards the Turks in the southern direction with the forces under his command, Suleiman the Magnificent was advancing towards Mohaj with his army. Finally, the two armies came face to face on the plain of Mohaj. Mohaj was located on the edge of the Danube, and right next to it was a swamp called Karosu in the course of the right branch of the Danube. To the southwest of the city, there was a hill rising in the form of an anteater, and at the southern foot of the sill, there was a church which the Turks called Ambush Church. Suleiman the Magnificent, who had the Nijinira till, had a commanding position over the valley stretching in front of him. The Ottoman army had adopted a different formation in this battle. In this new organization, three ranks were formed behind each other. In the front line was the Rumelian army under the command of Vizier Ibrahim Pasha. In the second line was the Anatolian army under the command of Behram Pasha, the Bailerbe of Anatolia. And in the third line was the Sultan with the Janissaries. 300 Ottoman cannons were lined up in two ranks behind the Rumelian and Anatolian soldiers. Malkoch Olibali Bey and Hisraf Bey, two of their Kinjis were laying in ambush on the ambush church site, waiting for the Hungarian attack. The reason for the abandonment of the classical Ottoman formation in this battle was the Hungarian armored cavalry. These armored cavalry were linked to each other with sharp chains and would advance by mowing down all the soldiers in a wide area. In addition, their armor was often impervious to arrows and swords. They could only be killed with a mace. This could only be possible with a charge to their flanks and rear. Therefore, such a gradual order of warfare was adopted. The Hungarian army was divided into two ranks according to its own battle plan. The first line was formed as center, right and left under the command of Commander Tomeri. The second line consisted of four columns under the command of King Louis. The 85 cannons of the Hungarians were placed in the center of the second line. At around half past one in the afternoon, the Hungarian army began to mobilize. The banners unfurled were the banners of the armored Hungarian cavalry. Thereupon, Suleiman the Magnificent had his own banners unfurled. At that time, Sultan Suleiman, whose eyes filled with tears, raised his hands to the sky and said, O oh Allah, might and strength are from you, help and protection are from you, at the Ummah of Muhammad. 
Upon this, all the cavalry dismounted from their horses and prostrated themselves. Vizi Ibrahim Pasha took the lead of the Rumelian army to fight in the front lines. Breaths were held. The Hungarian armored cavalry was coming upon the Ottoman soldiers like raging torrents. The charge of the Hungarian armored cavalry was awesome. In the first moments, the Romanian troops were badly battered against them. But Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha skillfully managed to spread his troops to the sides. The Hungarian horsemen, who had pierced the Romanian soldiers, rushed into the Anatolian soldiers. When the Anatolian troops under Behram Pasha's command were also quickly thrown to the flanks, the Hungarian army continued to ride towards the Janissaries. They were followed by the second line of cavalry under the command of King Louis. While the Hungarians were making such progress, the Akanjis under the command of Hilsrev and Balibase started to press the Hungarians from their flanks and rear. It was at this moment that the Hungarian soldiers were confronted with 300 Ottoman cannons. Rapidly fired Ottoman cannons started to pierce the Hungarian armored soldiers. When the Hungarian cavalry, which was also pressed from the right and left sides, started to retreat, the Ottoman army became more united. The Akinjis, on the other hand, blocked the way back for the Hungarians. Thus, there was only one direction left for the trapped Hungarian soldiers to escape, and that was the Karasu Swamp. Most of the Hungarians who did not know where to escape drowned in these swamps. Very few were able to escape and save their lives. As a result of this battle, which lasted only two hours, almost the entire Hungarian army was destroyed. Among the Hungarian soldiers bogged down in the swamp was the Hungarian King Louis II. Thus, this war became the shortest war in the history of the world and the most unforgettable tragedy in Hungarian history. The Hungarians, whose king had died, had no forces left to defend themselves. Suleiman the Magnificent and his army moved from here and marched to Buda, the Hungarian capital. The city of Buda surrendered the keys of the city to Sultan Suleiman without any defense. Thus, the 526-year-old Hungarian kingdom came under Ottoman rule as a result of only a two-hour battle. Suleiman the Magnificent, who celebrated Ramadan in Belgrade, celebrated Eid al Adha in Buda. The fall of Hungary against the Ottomans in such a short period of time caused a tremendous fear in all Europe. Europeans had only one sentence on their lips. The Turks are coming. <laughs>